We started MPI uh, by talking about the advantages and the disadvantages, and we'll look at that for each of our different methods that we, we do. So MPI, again, stands for Magnetic Particle Inspection. And so we've got a few kind of background areas we got to look at before we get too far into it. So the first is magnetism. And most people are familiar in some form or another with magnetism. You've all, pl you've all played with magnets and probably have magnets on the fridge and all that. But looking at it at a little bit deeper level um, for, for magnetic particle inspection, we're going to be testing parts that are ferromagnetic. Our parts have to be ferromagnetic and they have to have the ability to be magnetized. So ferromagnetic means that they're able to be magnetized. And what happens is inside the part, um, in the, the grain structure and the particles and the crystals that make up the part, those individual, again, grains, crystals, kind of the, that the inside the metal, inside the material, have their own little magnetic fields. And normally, if a part's not magnetic, if it's not magnetized, those fields are all pointing in different directions. They're randomly scattered, and so, you know, with probability, random probability is that for every one, you know, where the North Pole is on the right, the South Pole is on the left, there's another one where the South Pole is on the right, and the North Pole is on the left, and they cancel each other out. So when you have a bunch of random magnetic fields, they all kind of, all together, the, the part itself doesn't have an overall magnetic field. When we magnetize the part is we take all those individual little magnetic fields for all the different um, grains and, and atoms and in the part, and we align them. And so when they are aligned, that magnetic field, so in this case, we're showing a magnetic field left to right, um, that magnetic field gets stronger. You know, they, they build on one another. And when they're all aligned, when they become, um, cohesive like this, you end up with a part that has an overall magnetic field. And so this is what we're going to do to our part. We're going to take it normally from this demagnetized state, and we're going to force it into a magnetized state, either um, by running electricity through it, or running electricity through a coil nearby that induces a strong magnetic field. And so you can, you can magnetize a part, you can get all these fields in the same direction, uh, by putting a part, a piece of ferromagnetic material, in close proximity to a strong magnetic field, or the part itself can build a strong magnetic field through electromagnetism, and then when you shut that, that current off, the, those poles all stay aligned. Uh, and so that's how we're going to build a field in here, and then we're going to apply particles that also that react to that magnetic field and observe how those particles essentially sit on the surface of the part. So magnetism is known as flux, okay? You'll hear it talked about as flux. And we see this um, in, when you have your uh, avionics class. Have you, have you had navigation where they've talked about flux gates at all? I don't know if you're that far along in avionics. So. So if an aircraft for its, um, for its primary navigation system uses the Earth's magnetic field, it has something called flux gates in the wing. Those are, those are sensors that can, can uh, pick up and, and detect the Earth's magnetic field. Um, but magnetism or flux is, in this case, induced by passing electricity through or around a part. And some of the key points are it has a orientation or a direction, and most people know that as a North Pole and a South Pole. That's how it's described most often because it kind of relates to the magnetic field that's around the Earth where we have a North Pole and a South Pole. Um, if we induce a current, when we do induce a current flow in order to build up this magnetic field, it is going to be, it's going to develop, the magnetic field itself is going to be 90 degrees to the current flow direction. And that becomes important because we actually have to magnetize our part in different directions in order to find cracks or discontinuities or things like that that may go in different directions. When the current's being applied, it's greatest. So we, um, we align all those poles. And depending on the properties of the material, it may hold on to that magnetic field better or worse than other materials. Okay. Something like pure iron, has a, it has a very high, what's called retentivity. It holds on to that, it retains that magnetic field very well. 
compared to something like stainless steel where it can be magnetized while current's running through it. But as soon as you turn the current off, that magnetic field starts to drop away very quickly. Those, those individual magnetic fields start to re-randomize on their own, okay? Um, and then the units of flux, the way we measure this, it's measured in something called Gauss. And we use Gauss meters in order to check for the presence of a magnetic field as part of the testing process. And what happens is this flux, so to go back a slide, you can see it travels through the part. It also travels kind of around the outside of the part where it's jumping from end to end here. And not only is it traveling through the part, but it's going to be traveling along the surface of the part as well. Well, when we have a, some kind of a discontinuity in the material, it's going to cause that flux to, to jump across that discontinuity early. A, an extreme version of that is this. The discontinuity is the two ends of the part, and the flux field is jumping from one end to the other. Okay, all parts that are magnetized are going to do that. That's that magnetic field you can detect around the outside of a part. If you bring a compass near a magnet, the magnet causes the compass to move. You're detecting that magnetic field that's jumping from one pole of the magnet to the other. If you have a small break in a part, you can also detect where that field jumps. And that's where our little particles that we're going to be using stick. They get caught up in that magnetic field. Okay. So a visual, if, I'm sure you've seen this in basic electricity. If you have a wire, and here we've got current direction thumb pointed towards negative, it's uh, the right hand rule. The uh, magnetic field is going to wrap around, you know, the direction of the fingers. So we're not as concerned, in fact, we're not even gonna figure out while we're testing, it really doesn't matter, is the field, is the north on the right and the south on the left, or is the south on the right and the north on the left, there we go, I'm getting them opposite. For us, it doesn't matter which way it's pointed, and it doesn't matter which way that field is rotating or, or which way that flux is pointing around the part. We're just going to make sure that there's a field. In fact, our field that we're going to use, we're going to use AC, we're going to use alternating current, it's going to flop back and forth while we're magnetizing. And then when we stop magnetizing, it's going to be one direction or the other, but we never know which way it is. And it really doesn't matter for our purposes. Okay, every time that in, in the United States, power, the sine wave oscillates 60 times a second. So 60 times a second, it flops from one direction to the other. So you don't know when you let go of the button that causes the magnetism, you don't know which way it's facing. But if you knew which way was positive and negative at that very you know, fraction of a second, when you stopped putting that alternating current through the part, you could, in theory, figure out which way the magnetic field had formed. What's important for us is, in this case, if we ran power through this rod right here, the magnetic field would be creating circles, it would be you know, circular around the outside of it or around the surface. Consequently, if we run the current through a coil around the outside of the part, the magnetic field would run with the length of this rod. And we've got some illustrations of that a little bit later on. So as we get into this, there's a few things that we, a few terms that we're going to need to know and kind of keep in mind uh, as we go through this process. So different materials are going to react to becoming magnetized into this electromagnetism process in different ways. And we can describe that in a few different ways. So the first is permeability. Now, most people have probably heard of permeability of things like filters or how easy it is for like water to get through something, right, to, to permeate through something. But in this case, it's the ease that we can magnetize a part. Okay? A part that is highly permeable is easy to magnetize. A part that has low permeability is difficult to magnetize. And what I mean by that is get that magnetic field to form in the first place. With enough current, you can magnetize pretty much anything. But with enough current, you'll turn anything into a pool of liquid as well. So there are some things where you just can't magnetize them before they would melt or before they would catch fire because of heat. So you know, metals are conductive, so we can actually run a current through them. And some materials don't, don't conduct current at all, so you're not going to get any kind of magnetism. But in terms of those items that, that are able to conduct, the permeability will vary depending on the material. Reluctance is the resistance to magnetism. So you can see these are kind of opposite of each other. Something that's highly perme permeable, right, it's easy to magnetize, has low reluctance. 
right? And something that is, has low permeability is going to be highly reluctant. It's going to be reluctant to become magnetized. It's going to resist being magnetized. Okay, so those are kind of opposites of each other. Flux density is a measure of the strength. How close together, the way we see it visually, the way we display it visually, is how close together are those field lines. If you're familiar with maps, a steep hill is shown by topographic lines close together, kind of the same thing. The closer together those field lines are drawn, the more, the higher the strength of the field. So what I mean by that is if we have a part, you know, uh, we'll just call it, let's say this is our magnet, here's our north end and our south end, Right, if it, you know, if we draw it and it's just got a few lines like this, right, we're going to call that, in my example here, I'm going to say that it is a weaker magnetic field, it has lower magnetic strength, it has a low flux density. If we were to have additional lines in here, you know, make that field stronger in the roughly same area, right, now this part is being drawn with a stronger magnetic field because it shows a greater density of flux lines there. Okay. Residual magnetism it was, is what happens when we shut the current off that we're using to magnetize a part. It's kind of what I talked about earlier, the difference between iron and stain, pure iron and stainless steel. Pure iron is, has high residual magnetism. We run a current through it, a magnetic field builds up. When we shut that current off, that magnetic field barely drops. It stays very, very strong. Okay. Whereas something like stainless steel, we run a current through it. We get a magnetic field that builds up. As soon as we turn that power off, that magne magnetic field drops significantly. This can have a big impact on how, uh, how well these particles we're going to be using to detect that magnetic field stick to the part. So. It, it can go both ways as well. Um, you can actually have too many magnetic particles stick to the part, and then you can't see what's going on. You can also have too few particles stick to the part, and then you can't see anything at all. So um, the, it can work with us or against us. Retentivity ties in with residual magnetism. That is something that is retentive, has the ability to hold magnetic field. It has high retentivity is it's going to hold on to magnetic field, so that, that iron, versus that stainless steel has a low retentivity. It doesn't retain the magnetic field very well. And then coercive force is what do we have to do to demagnetize something. The higher its retentivity, the more coercive force, how much, you know, we, it's going to take more to demagnetize it because it wants to stay magnetized. Those individual fields want to stay aligned. Whereas something that is low retentivity, has low retentivity, it's going to be much easier to remove the magnetism. We can look at these in graph form and how they're displayed in graph form. So what we have here is a part that's not magnetized is going to start at this origin. That's the, the base of this blue dashed line here. Okay, so part. When we apply a magnetizing force, and we're just going to look at the top half of this graph for now. When we apply a magnetizing force, and the magnetizing force in the case of, of ours is we're going to apply a current. We're going to run electrical current through the part that's going to build up magnetic field. You can also bring a powerful magnet near another piece of material. You can actually use one magnet to magnetize another material. Uh, example of that is if you are working with magnetic screws and you want them to stick to your screwdriver, you can take like a bar or horseshoe magnet and run it up down the length of your screwdriver a bunch of times, and then the screws will stick to the end of your screwdriver. Doesn't work if they're stainless steel, but it works if you're using standard steel hardware. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes, yeah, some things you can like hit, it'll do it in certain ways. Sometimes it'll demagnetize if you if you strike something too um, that's already magnetic. Yeah. So yeah, people, there are ways to like hit stuff, um, bring them in contact with a strong magnet, slide a magnet along a piece of metal. But we're going to use electricity since it's easiest for us to control because so we control when it's on and off. We can control what the strength of it is. Um, if you have a DC machine, which we don't have, you can control the direction. AC, our direction is going to flop back and forth. 
Okay. And that's what's shown here is an AC machine that's gonna fly back and forth here 60 times a second. But we're just gonna look at the top half. So for one, one fraction of a second, when we turn that machine on, you know, as, the, as our alternating current reaches the top of its sine wave, right, that's gonna increase this magnetic force to the right. And as the magnetic force increases, the flux density is gonna increase. And you can see it's not a linear change, but rather it's logarithmic. It's exponential. And it's a decaying exponential. There's a point known as saturation where the part is fully magnetized. What's happened to those particles at saturation? What do you think happens at the saturation point with those individual magnetic fields and all the particles? That's the point where they're all aligned, okay? Once they're all aligned, you cannot make them align more. They're all parallel with each other. The magnetic field has gotten as strong as it's gonna get. So the, the key there is if we keep adding magnetizing force beyond that saturation point, it's not gonna get any higher because we've aligned all the poles. What is gonna increase as we increase that magnetizing force, that current? What happens if we run current through a part? It heats up. So once we reach that saturation point, adding additional current, all it's gonna do is have the potential to damage a part. So what we wanna do is we wanna do a level of current that reaches the saturation point without overheating the part. And the smaller, and, and it, it, part of it plays into these items I talked about, right? Something that is, has high permeability, low reluctance, you don't need as much current as the same size part that has low permeability. However, at the same time, you don't wanna send the same amount of current through a little engine valve as you do through a crankshaft. You know, the crankshaft could probably handle a lot more current than a little tiny engine valve. Okay, so that's the saturation point. That's where all the poles have aligned. Now, in the case of our, um, our, our flux density curve here, if we turn off that current, or you know, we're using an AC, it's gonna come back down to zero. We turn off our magnetizing force. You can see it's gonna drop a little bit, the actual magnetic flux density, right? The strength of the magnetic field is gonna drop a bit, but it's gonna retain a certain amount of it. You know, and this is it, a high retentivity material. This point here is gonna be closer to the saturation point. A material with low retentivity, it's gonna drop a lot further. Okay? That's just when you shut it off. We're just gonna say we shut the machine off at this point. Where does it end up? What's the strength of that magnetic field? Again, it's not gonna stay fully saturated necessarily. Some materials are gonna stay really close. Pure iron stays very, very close to true saturation. But you'll get a few you know, atoms that go out of alignment. But it's still gonna maintain most of that field. Stainless steel, that's gonna drop a lot more. Okay? or even something like copper or nickel, we can actually, we can, they can magnetize with the currents on, their saturation, or sorry, their retentivity is gonna drop pretty much back to zero. As soon as you turn the current off with a copper bar, there is no magnetic field anymore. But you do get a magnetic field while that current's running. Then if we were to reverse our current, whether we wanna demagnetize a part, or in the case of here where we're using alternating current, Right? It's gonna take a certain amount <clears throat> of current in the opposite direction to bring that magnetic field back to zero. So that's shown by coercivity. So the higher the coercivity, the further this point C would be over to the left, right? You need something that is, has something that requires a high coercive force the current's gonna be further, you know, the, the amount of current negative is gonna be further to the left. And then if we continue to, to increase that, that magnetizing force in the opposite direction, you can see it'll saturate the opposite direction. This is where the North Poles have flipped to the South Pole and the South Poles have flipped to the North Pole. But again, we reach a point where all the poles in those individual atoms, individual grains, have flipped direction and now we've reached the maximum 
field strength we're going to get in the opposite direction. And then the process starts back over again. The current goes back to zero. We end up with a, a negative retentivity point. You can see it's the same distance. It's symmetrical, right? And then the current would have to come back. So once the machine's up and running, it's going to flip back and forth. And at some point, we're going to let go. We're going to shut that machine off. And we're going to be likely most either at one of the two retentivity points. And that's what I was talking about. It doesn't matter which one we're at. We just want to make sure that our part is magnetized. And we'll check that with a Gauss meter or a flux meter. A real simple version of one of these, something you've probably all played with, is a compass. A compass is a flux meter, a Gauss meter. It aligns with it. Now, a, an actual Gauss meter, flux meter we have, tells you there's a field, which is what a compass tells you, but then it can also give you a strength number. Okay? But that's partly dependent on how close you put it to the field. As you get closer to the surface of the part, the field intensity is going to increase. It's also based on as you move through that field. So as you, as you, you have to be moving through the field in order to sense that field. Another way to look at these different parts is these magnetic properties is kind of in a table like this. So this is where I was talking about, you know, some of these are related. They're, they're inverse of one another. Soft iron, think about that as mainly pure iron, hard steel, tool steel, or getting into even stainless steels, right? So permeability, it's easy to magnetize, whereas something like stainless is hard to magnetize, low permeability. Reluctance is opposite of permeability, right? So those are flipped, okay? Once the magnetic field is formed, you can see the iron's gonna have a very strong field, the hard steel, you won't even get as strong a field. Its saturation point will not produce as dense of a magnetic field as a, low, a part that has low ultimate flux density. Residual magnetism, how much it hangs on to, you know? which is tied to retentivity. If it's easy to magnetize, it's also easy to demagnetize. Okay, the iron will demagnetize easily. The steel will hold on to it, it'll be harder. And then the coercive force, what you have to do to undo that retentivity, right? The better a material hangs on to the magnetic field, the harder it's gonna be, the more coercive force you're gonna need in order to undo that. So here's that illustration of a magnet. And here I'm using just a horseshoe magnet rather than an electromagnet. So you don't have to use an electromagnet. Most of the time we do. We can control a magnet, uh, an electromagnet. We can turn it on and off. Electromagnets can also typically give us much stronger magnetic fields than a, than a uh, fixed magnet or a permanent magnet. But we can do this with a, with a permanent magnet as well, as shown here, a permanent uh, horseshoe magnet. So if we place this magnet on our part, you can see that field that would normally be jumping between the north and south poles now is going to go through our part. And it's going to any of those, any of those atoms and grains of the part that it passes through, it's gonna align the fields in the part material with the field being generated by the magnet. So now our part becomes magnetized, except what happens, just like the magnetic field is going to jump from the north end to the south end, when you get a discontinuity, you're going to see this, this kind of right half of the part. You get a south end at the end and north at the side of the crack. And then you get another south pole at the left side of the crack and a north pole at the end of the part. And so just like the flux wants to jump from one end of the part to the other, the flux is also going to jump from that north pole to the south pole that make up the two sides of the crack. And where that's jumping, you can see it comes out away from the surface of the part. If you sprinkle a magnetic powder on there, basically iron filings, or you put iron filings on there that are suspended in the liquid, they're going to stick and align to that magnetic field that's, that's jumping across the, the discontinuity. And so this crack may be too small to see, but we can see where those particles are gathering. 
And it tells us, we don't see the crack itself, but we see evidence of that magnetic field jumping from one side of the crack to the other. And so we can find damage to a part that's not visible in the naked eye by using the magnetic field. So here's what that looks like once we've placed our particles on there. Now to aid us, to, even, to help us do this even more, modern magnetic particle inspection, those particles are coated in, and, and they're a dust basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's like iron filing or iron dust with a coating on it that is either a color or fluorescent. And so it helps us see it even better. So when we do this process, there's, there's, when we do MPI, there's a process we have to follow. The first thing is we want to make sure the part is clean. If it's covered in grease and oil, that's also going to cause those, those particles to stick, right? If there's a bunch of crud on there or other things, if you have a really thick layer, that magnetic field may not make it past that surface of that thick layer, especially, you know, there can be even real thick paints that, that can obscure this. We're going, and plus you have to be able to run a current through it, so you have to have bare metal to be able to run a current, right? Somehow we got to run a current through a part or run a current around a part. But you have to have bare metal in order to do that. So you have to clean the part. The other part is if there's oil and grease on it and you start running a lot of current through it and it heats up, you don't want that oil or grease to catch fire. So clean the part first, then we're going to magnetize it, whether we use an electromagnet or fixed magnet. Most of the time we're going to use an electromagnet. Electromagnets can be uh, portable. They can be something you can carry out to uh, and use on location, or they can be a fixed bench, fixed location. Once we've magnetized the part, we're going to apply those ferromagnetic particles. We're also going to check our magnetic field to verify that the part magnetized properly, the residual field, right, because, you know, if we shut the current off. And then we can inspect the part. We want to make sure there's a field there for these particles to stick to. And these can be done, I've got them in this order, they can really be done in any order. Oftentimes, usually we'll, we'll apply the ferromagnetic particles while magnetizing the part, check the field, you know, shut the magnetizing uh, current off, check the field, and then do the inspection. So they can kind of be done together at times or in a different order, but all those elements need to be there. Cleaning the part has to be at the beginning, inspecting the part at the end. When we're done, we don't want to leave our parts magnetic, especially if we find it's a serviceable part and we're going to be using it again. We don't want, most of the time, we don't want our parts to be magnetic. I mentioned this with the, um, the disadvantages in the last, the last time we met. You know, a magnetic part can, on an aircraft, can interfere with navigation systems. It can interfere with communication systems. If you have a magnetic field or a magnetic field near some kind of a, a communication antenna, or again, like the flux gates, the navigation flux gates that sense magnetic field, right? You've got magnetized parts that have a much stronger field than the Earth's magnetic field. That's going to cause problems. The other thing is if you have internal parts, like engine parts, you know, if you have a crankshaft that has, that's magnetic, the, if you get wear and any kind of grinding going on inside the engine, you get metal particles starting to move around in the oil, rather than making their way to the filter and being filtered out, they get stuck to the crankshaft and end up between the crankshaft and the bearings, right? And just continue to cause more and more damage and wear and tear. So we want to demagnetize the part when we're done. We check the magnetic field again to make sure that's been done successfully. You want to clean off any re uh, residue from the actual testing process. And then we we're going to report out on the results. So when we clean the part, it's essential that those particles have unimpeded path to that leakage, to that leakage field. They like said thick layers can totally obscure the field. Sticky stuff can cause the particles to stick improperly. So we have to remove things like grease, oil, paint, dirt, and other things. Um, dirt can also, you know, other particles can also obscure what you're able to see. You know, it can just interrupt the ability to see things. Um, but we don't want those cleaning particles, those cleaning solvents and whatnot, cleaning materials, solvents or detergents, to affect our test as well. So we got to make sure those are cleaned off properly. 
whether it's you using something that evaporates easily or like with our parts, we'll clean them in the, um, the, wash, the washroom we've got down there. We've got like mineral spirits in there. They don't have to be perfectly dry. We'll blow them off. Once you've cleaned them in the wash tanks, you'll blow them off. If they're not perfectly dry, it's not the end of the world because the, the particle bath, the liquid we use to, to apply these particles is also a mineral spirits based uh, oil. And so, you know, they don't have to be perfectly clean, but you, do, you don't want to mix a ton of it back and forth, okay? When we magnetize it, direction's important. Now, when I say direction is important, direction, I don't care if north is over here or south is over here. What I'm worried about is the fact that in this, you know, in this drawing I've got right here and what I've shown, you know, the magnetic field say is going this way, right? It's going left to right, right to left inside of our part, okay? So if we have a crack in the surface, that field's gonna have to jump from one side to the other, okay? What happens if my crack runs parallel, though? Now my field's not gonna jump across my crack. So direction is important is that we're gonna have to actually magnetize it in two different directions. And if instead of running, in this case, we would have run a current around the outside of the part to do the field this way, if we run a current through the part, we'll actually get magnetic fields wrapping around the part, which become perpendicular to that. We'll look at that here in a second. So that's where this circular and longitudinal. So this is a longitudinal field due to circular current flow. And the, out, the other one we'll do is longitudinal current flow to give us circular fields. And our testing device have the ability to do that. If we're using portable equipment, we can attach our electromagnet one direction, and then we can turn our electromagnetic magnet the other direction. Okay. The current required is typically going to be specified by the part manufacturer, keeping in mind the current is pretty much directly related to the size of the part. The bigger the part, the higher the current you're gonna need to reach that saturation point. The smaller the part, you don't wanna overheat it. If you, if you give it more current than it needs to reach the saturation point, it's not gonna hurt it as long as you don't overheat it. So you wanna make sure you reach that point without damaging it. Actual current often has to be set, established by trial. We start at a lower amperage and increase until you reach a desired amperage. Our machine does not have an amperage, uh, the dial that sets it, and, and most eddy current, or ultra, most magnetic particle machines do not have a dial that says 100 amps, 200 amps, 300 amps. They have a dial that looks like a volume control knob. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Maybe it goes to 11. Anyone? It goes to 11. No? Okay, I got a few now. Remind me of the movie now, the title. It's a British guy. Yes. Uh, it's a movie about like hair bands in the 1980s. And their amp goes, they got this special amp that goes to 11 because everything else goes to 10. So it's one more than 11. It's one better than 10. I'll remember it here in about five minutes, I'm sure. Um, I'm terrible, I, like I remember scenes in movies, but I'm terrible remembering the titles of movies. So, thank you, who said Spinal Tap? Yes, it's Spinal Tap, that's it. Um, it's a satire of like 1980s hair bands, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty funny movie. I know it's old and I'm dating myself, but hey, it was old when I was younger. I was born in the 80s, so it's not like I could see it when I was young. Um, but current required, specify that, so you set the current the reason that they're set that way is the current, you've all been in electrical, current is directly related to the voltage and the resistance, right? V equals IR. So different size parts and different material parts, when you put them into the machine, are going to have different resistances. So a knob setting of, say, 5 with one part is going to get one current. The voltage is always the same, but a knob setting of 5 with a part in there is gonna give a current for that part. And if you put a different part in and set that knob to five, you're gonna end up with a different current. 
because the resistances are going to change for each part. So you know, it may say you need to run 500 amps to the part. You may have to play with that dial a little bit. Even, even two parts that are essentially the same part, if there's enough difference in the material, you know, it may change that resistance a little bit. Or even how you clamp it in there. If you get, if you get it clamped in better one time and not quite as good the next time, that's going to change the total resistance. And so you have to play with that. Yeah. Uh, same, well, you can, you can run different materials in a, so we'll run, um, like connecting rods and they'll still have the bronze bushings in them. You don't necessarily have to remove the bronze bushings. It's not going to hurt anything. Now that, that point where the, the steel connecting rod and the bronze bushing come together, there's that little rit, right? You can, that's going to be a point that collects particles, but you would expect them. That would be a non-relevant indication because the field's jumping. Now those bronze bushings are not going to stay magnetized to the same level that the steel crank or uh, steel connecting rod is going to stay magnetized. However, they will be subject to the magnetic field of the residual magnetism from the steel connecting rod that's surrounding them. And we check our parts. So here is a Gauss gauge, as I was talking about. As we move this, we're going to point the arrow towards the part. You're going to hold it in your hand. It's about a big round, about the size of a, well, size of a compass. <laughs> uh, and you're going to point the arrow towards the part, and you're going to move it around. And what you're looking for is the maximum deflection. Ours show up to 10 Gauss, positive and negative. Now, if you take this gauge, say this was my part, this Gauss gauge, and I move it one way, it's going to cause that needle to deflect to the positive side. If I bring it back that way through the magnetic field, it's going to go to the negative side. So that's what I was talking about. We don't know which direction our field's forming or has formed. We just want to know that a field has formed. So you kind of wave it back and forth. It's like, oh, it's bumping up to about three each time I go by. Positive three, negative three, positive three, negative three. Okay, it's about three gauss. Okay. We have a fixed bench. This is an example of a fixed bench that shows kind of the components we have here. So uh, the base of the, the, the bench down here contains a fluid tank, and then there's a applicator. We have a hose with a little, a little valve on the end of it. So our particles are suspended in fluid that we can apply to the part. We have a control panel down here. Here's that, that dial I was talking about that sets the current. We have a button to turn it on, push the button, cause the uh, current to flow, release it. We have another, in this case, there's a switch, switch between whether we're gonna send current through this, what's called head and tail stock. You can see there's big wires coming off of them, copper pads, that's gonna run current through the part or through this coil right here that'll surround it. And we're gonna typically run current through one, do the inspection, and then through the other and repeat the inspection in order to find cracks that may go two different directions. And then as I mentioned, the head and tail stock, we, these, this, this head stock is fixed in position. Tail stock can move so we can set it and then clamp our part in between those. And this ring, the coil ring, has the ability to roll side to side to be able to go different parts. Because we may not, we may have to move the coil to two different locations on a particularly large part, like a crankshaft. So if we use the coil, this is what I was talking about, we're going to get about six to nine inches of, of um, saturation on each side of the coil. So here it shows a crankshaft. Now the crankshaft is not. Um, clamped into the head and tail stock right now. But in this case, you're probably going to be OK to magnetize the entire part. But again, if you're doing something larger, longer, it's going to need to be done at two different places. So here's kind of those illustrations of that. So here's a part where we have a longitudinal magnetic field. Longitudinal means it's running the length of the part. In order to do this, we've done a circular current. So the current, whoops, the current has been run through this coil of wire surrounding the part. Now the part doesn't touch it while it's doing it, but when you run a current through this coil, 
right, 90 degrees to the coil windings, we're going to get a field that runs left to right or right to left. So here's that field running longitudinally down the part. We can have cracks that run longitudinally, we can have cracks that are transverse, or we can have cracks at an angle. So here, the longitudinal defect likely will not show, or it will not show very well. Okay? The transverse defect will show up the best, right? because it's 90 degrees to the magnetic lines of flux. So those, that magnetic flux is going to have to jump from one side of this crack to the other. Defects that are at some kind of an angle will be at, you know, somewhere in between. So uh, a 45, you know, a, a, a crack in this case that is more longitudinal than transverse. You know, if we have a, an angled crack that's kind of going more longitudinal, it will not show up as well as a crack that maybe isn't perfectly transverse, but is more, you know, is closer to transverse. Okay. So the angle to the magnetic field plays an important role in how well it will show up. The other one I want to look at, because we started talking about it today, is the circular field. So here, you can see we've got the coil pushed out of the way. Now we've got our part in these copper pads. We're going to run a current through the part, and that will cause a circular field, right here, shown here, to build up in our part. And so now we'll be able to we'll be able to see those longitudinal cracks a lot better, but the transverse crack likely will not show up as well. And then same thing with cracks at different angles or that may be irregular, they'll have, you'll have varying degrees of being able to see them based on how well they are or how, how they're oriented in relation to the magnetic field. So we'll go ahead and stop there for today.